So now, without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the last speaker uh, for this geometry festival, Peter Kronheimer from Harvard. He's going to talk about instanton homology for knots and wet. Thank you. Just this bangle. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some topics which go back quite a long way, but which have uh, met and interacted um, rather more recently. Would you speak, uh, speak a little louder? No, that's for the taping. Oh, that's just taping. That's fine. Um, I'll, I'll try to talk a bit louder. I will come over here, but then get back closer as well. So, the two <coughs> topics of the talk, I mean, it's really mostly the the first of these that I'm going to be talking about, this is instant on homology um, as an invariant for knots. Um, I'll also be talking rather less about Havanov homology, and one of the reasons I'm interested in both of these right now is the way they interact. Um, instant on homology was originally thought of mostly um, in the context of um, the structure group SU2 though one can generalize it to SUA, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Havana homology also has a certain n equals 2 origin, and when one generalizes Havana homology, um, one obtains, amongst other things, Havana rosansky homology. So since both of the items on the first two lines have generalizations, it's natural to look for um, relationships between instanton homology for SUN and havanov rosansky homology, and I'll be talking a bit about that too. And this is um, joint work with, with Tom Rufko at MIT. So before going on to the next slide, perhaps I want to say a tiny bit about instanton homology and um, how it first appeared in, in the work of Andreas Fleur. Um, so the, the starting point here is a closed-oriented smooth three-manifold Y, and um, over it a, <coughs> a vector bundle, which um, I think I might suppose is the trivial bundle, Cn times Y, with uh, the standard Hermitian inner product on the fibers. And then one looks at um, unitary connections in the fixed vector bundle over Y. Um, so all unitary connections. <coughs> These form an affine space, infinite dimensional affine space, on which there's the, the Chern Simons functional, CS for Chern Simons function on the space of connections <coughs> with, um, with real values. My A has gradually turned into a U. There we are. So the key properties of the churn simons functional are critical points are exactly the flat connections. So the flat connections are related to the representations of the fundamental group in the unitary group. Um, if you introduce a uh, Riemannian metric on the three-manifold Y, then there's a L2 in a product <coughs> um, on the tangent space, this affine space of connections. And then you can consider the formal gradient of the chern simons functional. And the formal gradient flow for a path of connections A of T. Um, the gradient flow equations, are, the formal gradient of Chern Simons is um, the matrix valued one form, which is the Hodge star of the two dimensional, the, the two form, the curvature of, of the connection A. 
So this is the formal gradient flow, and Fleur's construction of instanton homology rests on a key observation, which is the following. If I've got a one-parameter family of connections on the three-manifold Y, then you may look at it as defining a, a four-dimensional connection, a bundle, connection in the bundle over the cylinder, R times Y. So if you think of A of T, this path of connections, instead is defining a single connection, A, on the cylinder. Um, this equation, equation dagger, um, <coughs> tells us that this connection A has um, anti-self-dual curvature. So the curvature two-form in four dimensions being a two-form, you can split it up the way the two forms on a four-manifold, Mannion four-manifold, split up into the self-dual and anti-self-dual for two forms. And anti-self-dual curvature is the condition that the self-dual part, F plus, is zero. So this um, The construction of this formal gradient flow and the, um, its relation to the representations of the fundamental group of Y is the um, germ of Fleur's instant on Fleur homology. And through this observation, one sees that it's related to something which is um, the anti-self-dual Yang-Mills equations, um, solutions of which either on a four-manifold or on R4, often called instantons. And, um, this tied Fleur's work um, closely with the um, then quite recent work of, of Simon Donaldson in using instantons um, to study the topology of smooth four manifolds. So, um, oops, either zero or one. Instant, uh, right. That's, this time I haven't skipped. So, <coughs> here the situation is, is a three-manifold Y. I'm going to talk about an invariant of knots and links, which may lie in a three-manifold, but will usually for me lie in R3. Um, this is a variant of the Fleur homology, which goes back here to, to 1986. Fleur's work. Um, what is this instant on homology going to be? It's going to be a finitely generated abelian group. Um, for the unknotted circle in R3, it'll be Z plus Z. Um, for the trefoil, I've written down the answer. It's four copies of Z and a Z mod 2. One key property that this instant on homology for knots is going to have is um, here at the bottom, this unoriented skein relation. So you're supposed to imagine three different knots and links, which um, outside of a um, <coughs> outside of a single ball are, are all the same, but inside that ball, um, one of them looks like this, like here, and the other two are obtained by this modification. So this is the unoriented skein relation between three, um, three knots. That, that's a bit more symmetric in three dimensions than it, than it looks if you, if you, instead of thinking of that two-dimensional picture there, thinking, think, you think of the, a three-dimensional um, three ball, and think of a tetrahedron there with its six um, edges. Um, if you, so there are three opposite pairs of edges. If you um, focus on this opposite pair of edges, or this one, or this one, you obtain three different um, pairs of arcs inside the three ball, and that's another way of looking at what's going on here.
So as well as defining this Fleur homology for three manifolds in, in 1986, Fleur also defined an instant homology for knots. Um, one of the last so in one, of the, one of his last papers in about 1989. Um, our definition is slightly different from <coughs> the one that Fleur used. Um, but um, it actually gives the same answer for knots. So this, this really is an invariant of knots which can be seen to go back quite a, quite a long way. Um, in Fleur's work, he sort of pioneered looking at exact sequences coming from skein relations um, in this context. They're not, not exactly this uh, unoriented skein relation here. Um, although Fleur's work on Fleur homology has, has been you know, very, very influential, um, many big developments, this particular aspect of it, this instant homology for knots, I think was not a lot developed. There's an exposition of some of those ideas from Fleur's last papers um, by uh, Peter Brahm and Simon Donaldson, which appeared um, in the Fleur Memorial volume in 1995, but very little else um, has um, been written sort of based on this sort of 1989 paper. So how do, how do we define instanton Fleur homology for, for knots? So it starts with, with the knot group. Um, I sort of define it in a rather backwards way compared to the sketch I gave here for the original instant on flow homology case. It starts with the, with the knot group, pi, the fundamental group of the knot complement, um, in which there's a distinguished element or distinguished conjugacy class, at least if the, it's a knot rather than a link, that's, that's the meridional uh, conjugacy class. You choose a base point for your pi 1, choose a path from the base point to the knot, just go around that little linking circle and go back. Different path will give you a different conjugacy class, different element of the conjugacy class, but uh, I'll, I'll write it as if it's a distinguished element here. And I want to look at homomorphisms from the knot group into, in this case, SU2. Um, and I'm going to put the following constraint on these, that this Meridian element, or every element in that conjugacy class, should map under rho to um, this element of SU2 or something conjugate to it. That little tilde sign means conjugate to for me here. And I want to write uh, curly R of K as the set of all such homomorphisms rho. That's, that's the starting <coughs> point of what I want to do. So let, let's see what that actually does for the, for the unknot k. So the knot group pi 1 of the complement is just z for an unknotted circle k. Um, the meridional curve is a generator for that z. So a homomorphism rho from pi 1 to su2 is just determined by where m goes. And we've insisted that m go into the conjugacy class of i0, 0, zero minus i. So this is a sketch of the three sphere, which is su2. I0, 0, 0 minus I lies on the equatorial two-sphere, and um, its conjugacy class is that two-sphere. So to specify a homomorphism is just to specify where M goes, it goes somewhere on this two-sphere. So R of K is um, just a copy of that, of that two-sphere. That's, that's this representation variety for this unknot. Um, for the trefoil, um, there are, it has a non-abelian knot group now, um, there are some abelian representations, those that factor through the H1, which is Z, and that's again this, this two-sphere. Um, but there are also some irreducible representations, um, which are parameterized by a copy of SO3. If you want to think concretely about that, you can think of the presentation of the knot group by the Wurtinger presentation, which is the standard way to write it. And for, for the trefoil, the Wurtinger presentation has three generators, X, Y, Z. Um, and you, <coughs> you write it down, you know, this and the three cyclic rotations of this relation. Are, th these are the relations of the knot group for the trefoil knot. And um, each of x, y, and z is an element of the original conjugacy class. So each of those has to go to um, 
some point in the two sphere. Um, so if you're looking for elements of curly R, you're looking for three points in the two sphere. Um, this relation says that if I reflect Y through the point X, I'll get the point Z. And um, either X, Y, and Z can all be the same point, there's a two spheres worth of those, or X, Y, and Z can lie on a, um, an equilateral triangle on, on a great circle, and there's a SO3's worth of those. So they're actually very easy to sort of see geometrically, these representations. Normally when you talk about representation, the linear representation of a group, what you really mean in terms of homomorphisms is that that would be homomorphisms to the general linear group modulo conjugation by the linear group. Um, but that's not what I'm doing right now. I was talking about just the raw set of homomorphisms not dividing by conjugation. Um, because if I'm looking at flat connections up to isomorphism, I more naturally get homomorphisms modulo conjugation by the linear group. Um, the reason R of K is going to play a role for us rather than R of K divided by conjugation is the following slightly ad hoc looking, and indeed I think is rather ad hoc, device. Um, so given a not or link K, I'll write K sharp for the following gadget. It, it's K, but then disjoint union is some remote ball um, a hop link H, a two component link what there. What is the horizontal bar in the picture of the hop? So the horizontal bar is an extra, an added extra <laughs> for this hop link. What I want, what I want, and I'll talk more, more generally about trivalent graphs shortly, but this, this hop link has actually been decorated with an extra bar, so it actually becomes a trivalent graph embedded in three space. Um, and I want to look at representations of the complement of. Um, this augmented guy, which um, as well as having this condition on the meridian of K that they get mapped to something conjugate to this, I'll make the same in, in, insistence for the meridian, meridional curves on the, uh, on the hop flink. But I'll ask that this meridian, the meridian of the bar, mapped to this element, minus 1, 0, minus 1, this non-trivial central element of SU2. The reason for choosing that particular gadget is that there's a unique, essentially up to conjugation, a unique solution on that hop flink to that, to that problem, which if you think of the quaternions i, j, k as uh, elements of SU2, um, up to conjugation, um, this is m1 has to be i, m2 has to be j, their commutator is minus 1, and that's this element around the bar. So because there's a unique, irreducible solution here on this hop flink part, and because pi 1 here is a, just the you know, free product of these two guys, um, if I look at the original representation variety of k, but without dividing by conjugation, that's the same as looking at this more complicated representation variety and dividing by conjugation. So I've enlarged my, my k to some my more complicated gadget, the complicated gadget divided by conjugation is just the original guy without conjugation. So that's, you know, I'll really just be talking about this guy, but the reason it's actually relevant is that we're really doing something a little bit more complicated. So I can think now this representation variety as something a little bit more natural. It's the space of representations modulo conjugation of this other gadget. So I can now think of it as a moduli space of flat SU2 connections on the complement in S3 of this uh, link K together with this hop flink gadget. Um, flat connections up to um, isomorphism. So I can now think of that as critical points of this chern simons functional on a certain space of connections. Um, if I take the connections modulo automorphisms, modulo gauge, um, <coughs> I'll write curly B for the connections modulo gauge. The chern simons functional is, is real valued on the space of connections, but on the connections modulo gauge, it's not single valued anymore, so it takes values suitably normalized in, in R over Z. Um, so 
So now this representation of Adi Kuri, R of K, has begun to come into the realm of, um, of the, the setup used by Fleur. So I want to define now instant homology of the knot K, and I want to define it as the, the Morse homology of this functional on the space of connections, um, following Fleur's constructions. Um, technically, to do this, um, after all, I'm looking at a, a complement of a, of a knot in a three-manifold. Um, a convenient way to do this technically is to view the three-sphere with this embedded knot or this trivalent graph, view it as an orbifold. Um, with cone angle pi, so that's uh, instead of 2 pi, the cone angle is pi um, along these edges, the edges being the, the knot K, um, the knot or link in, in, in S3. And I can view <coughs> this space of connections as a space of orbifold connections um, in um, a bundle with structure group SU2 or SU2 over plus or minus 1. So this is the picture of the knot K. It's in a three-dimensional space, but in the normal directions, there's a cone with cone angle pi, and the holonomy um, around this um, single locus for the, the SU2 connection I'm considering will be I0, 0, zero minus I. I. If I pass then to the locally to the smooth branch double cover, branch along K, the whole number will be, will be minus 1. So as a SU2 over plus or minus 1 connection, as an SO3 connection, it, it's, th there's no apparent singularity there. It's a sort of orbifold SO3 connection. Does that work for the singular point on the It, uh, uh, the it does. And I, I'll actually talk about the trivalent graph uh, again later. So, so now we're all set to sort of follow the outline of, of, um, of Fleur's constructions. We can think of the gradient of the chern simons functional using an L2 in a product, um, using an orb orbifold Romanian metric on, on this three-dimensional space. Um, um, well, here it is. So we're <coughs> this guy, although it's a trivalent graph, this thing is also naturally an orbifold. Um, if, I, if I take the... If I take the three-dimensional ball um, with the three coordinate axes passing through it um, and divide by the Klein four group, so the, these, um, the group generated by these matrices, then the quotient is again homeomorphic to um, a ball but it's a homeomorphic to a ball containing three, um, three rays. So that's the appropriate orbifold picture for the trivalent graph. So the critical points of the chern simons functional are exactly our representation variety. And the gradient flow lines are sort of orbifold instantons, orbifold anti self dual connections on this cylinder. Um, So I didn't talk much about, you know, when I began this talk, I talked about the chern simons functional in, in, in the context of, of Fleur's original constructions. But what um, the outline of what one is supposed to do after that, although the details will vary every time, the, the plan is to define a homology theory um, as, um, as a Morse homology. Um, so the standard steps are to perturb the chern simons functional. Um, so the, the chern simons functional has as its critical points this representation variety R of k, which may be positive dimensional. Um, but after perturbation, um, the, um, the critical points will be isolated and satisfy a Morse condition. I missed what you said when you explained what the tilde over R of K means. Um, I didn't say actually, but I did, nor does it say on the transparency. But the tilde R, I think, is um, must be my notation for the perturbed representation variety. So R of K is the critical points of the chern simons functional. Um, the chern simons functional is then perturbed a little bit, add a small perturbing term, which I won't really discuss. 
and then there's a new set of critical points, which is now a finite set, as in <coughs> as in Morse theory. Um, and although there isn't a gradient flow defined by this functional flow, the idea is to construct a chain complex um, as one would in Morse theory, <coughs> whose generators uh, correspond to the critical points, and whose boundary map counts is uh, defined by counting flow lines, solutions of this equation, um, which are asymptotic one end to one critical point, and at the other to a different critical point. So it defines a <coughs> defines a, a boundary map on, th on this uh, chain complex. So the, now a particular example, that the definition of I sharp of K is that it's the homology of such a, such a chain complex. In some very simple examples, um, it can turn out that um, there are no relevant uh, parts of the differential, no flow lines between different components of the original representation variety. Um, it may be, in some situations, sort of perfect Morse function situation, that what this homology group ends up computing is exactly the ordinary homology of this representation variety. That's exactly what happens for the unknot. Um, for example, we, we saw that the representation variety for the unknot was a copy of the two sphere. Well, it turns out that the instanton homology of the unknot can be thought of as just the homology, ordinary homology of that two sphere. It's a copy of z plus z. Um, for the trefoil knot, the um, representation variety was a two sphere, and then a copy of SO3. These were the reducible, these were the irreducible representations. The ordinary homology of S2 disjoint union SO3 is a Z4 and a Z mod 2. Um, and that is, is indeed the instanton homology of, of the trefoil knot. Um, I haven't talked about um, the, um, the gradings here, and of course, the ordinary homology um, is a graded group. The instanton homology, as we've defined it, is uh, um, is not <coughs> is not graded. There is a a grading um, a cyclic grading by by z mod four, um, but not an not an integer grading. And this 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 isomorphism here, um, well, you wouldn't expect it to preserve the grading. You'd expect some some shifts, like a as e, as you would even in a in a familiar finite dimensional uh, Morse theory. So this is. A, a slide you've seen before, um, repeated here. We've talked about instant homology. I haven't talked about why there is this unoriented skein relation. That's an interesting story. It's closely related to a surgery exact triangle, which um, Fleur proved for the three manifold instant homology that he defined in 1986. Um, but I've explained briefly this invariant of knots and links, the fact that it's more or less by construction a finitely generated abelian group, and um, we saw briefly why the unknot and the trefoil give you these two. So, um, so Tom Mufko and I sort of were playing around, and we, we wrote this definition down quite a few years ago now, and we computed these two examples. Um, and then there's something which is quite quite striking. Um, there's something else which is going to feature in this talk now, which is Havana homology. Um, it was defined um, at the turn of the millennium by Mikhail Kavanov. Um, it's an invariant of knots and links in R3. Um, 
can't be generalized in any easy way to knots and links in general three manifolds, it's R3 or S3. Like instant homology, it's a finitely generated abelian group. Um, and it so happens that for the unknot, it's z plus z, and for the trefold, it's z to the fourth plus z mod 2. Um, and more or less from its definition and construction, the, I'm not going to talk much about the definition of Havana homology, but this unoriented skein relation is satisfied by Havana homology. Um, if you have three, um, three knots related by this unoriented skein relation, then there's a long exact sequence relating their um, Havanov homologies. Um, so this was sort of defined by Havanov in 1999 or so. Um, and by the time Tom Rufkin and I were trying to play around with instant homology and do these calculations, um, the Havanov homology of the trefoil was, I think, well known to people who knew anything about Havana homology, that that didn't include us at the time. Um, but the similarity is very striking, and um, it's particularly striking in, in that these um, instant homology and Havana whoops, homology would have such different origins. So Havana homology grew from the Jones polynomial, which was um, defined in 1984. Um, it comes from the world of quantum algebra. The definition of Havana homology is very um, algebraic. You can present it to smart undergraduates quite easily. Um, instant homology was defined at a similar time to the Jones polynomial. There's two big developments in the 1980s, um, defined using gauge theory through connections. Um, and although there were some terms in common, for example, the Jones polynomial was considered by Witten as coming from the Chern-Simons functional, um, instant homology and the Jones polynomial were really rather separate things. Um, for, uh, for a long time. So the fact that they turn out to be so closely related is, is, a, is a relatively recent um, discovery. So the fact that they're the same for the trefoil and the unknot um, is a consequence of a, a particular relationship here. This is the existence of a spectral sequence. Um, the spectral sequence which starts with Havana homology as its E2 term and which abuts to the instant homology um, that, that we've been discussing. Um, the reason that they're the same for the trefoil is just that nothing happens in the spectral sequence after the, after the E2 term. Um, I, I, I'm not going to define Havana homology <coughs> in detail, but um, you know, given a planar diagram of a knot or link with, with n crossings, um, then you can um, smooth out these crossings. There are n of them. Each one can be smoothed out in one of two ways, like so or like so. Um, and you'll obtain two to the n different so-called smoothings of this knot diagram. So each smoothing will just be a bunch of unlinked circles um, in the plane. Um, so for those of you that have sort of seen Havana homology either firsthand or presented in a talk before, um, what one does bit of algebra to compute um, <coughs> Havana homology is you draw the n-dimensional cube with its um, with its two to the n vertices here n is three um, at each vertex you associate you put a vector space determined in a simple way from this bunch of circles um, and then there's a differential you make this into a, a chain complex 
you have a differential whose um, components run along the edges of the of the cube in my picture starting here and ending here. Um, it turns out that you can compute instant homology from exactly a similar picture. Uh, it's just that the instant homology has some additional differentials which will run not just along the um, edges but also along the diagonals and great diagonals. Um, so um, from, from that point of view the Havanov um, Excuse me. Um, differential on the same complex as some d1, and for the instant on case, we, we've got a d1. In fact, it's only the odd diagonals. So the next one in that picture would be, would be the great diagonal d3, and then there'd be a five-dimensional great diagonal d5, and so on. So there's a larger differential on the same complex which computes instant on homology. Um, so. Uh, a consequence of the existence of this spectral sequence um, is as an application that Havana homology detects the, the unknot. That is to say, you can tell whether a knot is knotted by computing the Havana homology. If you get z plus z, it's the unknot, and if you don't, um, it's not. Um, this um, this is an attractive application because Havana homology is such a sort of basic simple thing to compute. I mean it's a um, it's a very ungeometric uh, environment. Um, it's an open question whether the Jones polynomial detects the unknot. Uh, so in some sense this is um, a related question but I, I don't expect that it's um, a useful step in the direction of that unsolved problem. The existence of this spectral sequence, do, do that cube picture, it's really, um, it's an idea related to a similar idea of Osvat and Sabo, who considered <coughs> the Haygard homology of branch double covers. Um, and really what's going on there, the, the core, mathematical core of it is, is the fact that instant homology satisfies this skein exact sequence. It's like generalization, that picture is really what makes that work. Um, so wh why does that imply that the Havana homology detects the unknot? So from the spectral sequence, it immediately follows that the rank of the Havana homology is at least as big as the rank of the instant on homology. Um, and er earlier work shows that the Hav instant on homology detects the unknot. The, the rank is at least two always, and strictly greater than two for non-trivial knots. Um, that in turn is. Um, It c c comes down to really an interesting statement about instant homology. It's um, you can think of it as as, as, as this a corollary really that it, if I have a non-trivial knot, then the representation variety is not going to just be this two sphere. Um, it must contain some other stuff. There must be some irreducible representations. Um, the reason that one can prove something like this for instant homology is because it's really a very three-dimensional thing. You can put it in an arbitrary three-manifold, you can cut your three-manifold along incompressible surfaces, you can glue your three-manifolds, you have all this flexibility of three-dimensional topology. In particular, um, the notion of sutured manifold decompositions, which are sort of introduced to topology by, by Gabay and were used in the context of Haygard flow homology first by Gigini and then Ni and Yuhaj. Um, so it, it's this uh, extra flexibility of instant homology that allows you to do this. Now, we defined our representation variety using SU2 connections, um, and we asked that the meridional element be mapped to the equatorial two-sphere, the Kondinsky class of I00 minus I in SU2. Um, I could have defined it, and it would have been more or less equivalent to, to ask that the meridional element mapped to this element of U2, um, so multiplied by, by I. Um, Think of <coughs> the representation of value defined uh, this slightly different but equivalent way. Um, having done that, you can see um, 
one of many possible ways to generalize this story. Um, suppose I want to replace n equals 2 by larger n. Um, I think of this as the essentially only interesting involution in, in U2. Um, let's look at the involutions in Un. So that's a bunch of minus ones, say k of them, and a bunch of plus ones. So let's write sigma sub k for that uh, involution in, in Un. It's a reflection in uh, n minus k plane. So now I need a not k in R3 and a choice, a weight, lowercase k, um, somewhere between 1 and n minus 1. And let's look for representations of the knot group in Un, um, mapping the meridional element to this chosen involution. So we've got a choice of k there. Previously, that would have been n equals 2 and k equals 1. So there's a representation variety we can consider here, just as we did in the previous case. Um, it turns out it's possible, profitable to, to, to generalize this picture a little bit to, to trivalent graphs rather than embedded curves, which would be the not k. Um, so suppose I have a trivalent graph and a, a weight on each edge. So here there's a single weight on the not k. We've got a, a graph with edges and a different weight, k, for each edge. Um, so then you're looking at a representation variety, which was also recently considered by Andrew Lobb and Raphael Zetner. Um, I've drawn a sort of example here. So this is a trivalent graph. I've associated a weight to every edge. Um, not arbitrarily, at every trivalent vertex here, um, there are three weights, k1, k2, k3. And in some ordering, um, I've... Um, I haven't written down the condition. In some ordering, I've <coughs> always arranged that k1 plus k2 is equal to k3. So, although there may not be a global orientation, if, if you look at it as locally as a sort of flow, uh, the flow is preserved. If, if the k1 and k2 are incoming, the total flow k3 is outgoing. So, 1 plus 1 is 2 here, and 2 plus 3 is 5 at the top vertex there. And let's look at... Um, representations of pi 1 of the complement. Um, I wonder if I didn't miss a... I don't know. I think I've lost a transparency at some point. I want to look at representations of the complement pi, again into un, such that each meridional curve, there's a meridian for each edge, m sub e for the edge e, should map to an involution whose negative eigenspace has got dimension k sub e. Um, if you look at these um, conditions, k1 plus k2 is equal to k3, um, I've got a block of size k1. If I put the block of size k2 with its minus ones here and multiply those, then I'll get a block of minus ones of size k3. So that's the model that's going to um, happen near each trivalent vertex, relying on the fact that for some conjugate of sigma k2, sigma k1 times that conjugate of sigma k2 is sigma k3. I'm writing gamma here for such a decorated um, trivalent graph. k is a trivalent graph lowercase k underlined as its um, assignment of weights. Again, there's a gadget I can put add to this, a bit like the Hopflink of before. Um, so I can think of actually R of gamma as representations modular conjugation on some slightly larger object. <coughs> I can think of this again as a moduli space of flat SUN connections in some orbifold context um, as critical points of the of an orbifold churn simons functional. And there's really very little difficulty in just generalizing the previous constructions to this I sharp n of gamma. Some more homology again of the churn simons functional. So trivalent graphs 
um, appeared in the generalization of Havanov homology earlier. They, they appeared in the work of Havanov and Rosansky on, on their um, havanov rosansky homology of, <coughs> of knots and links. They appeared, for example, in a version of the unoriented skein sequence. Um, if I have um, three knots or links related in this unoriented <coughs> skein way, for havanov rosansky's generalization of Havanov homology, it's no longer true that there's um, a skein relation related along exact sequence relating the, the homologies of these guys. And if you assign weights 1, 1 here, and 1, 1 there, there is, however, um, a long exact sequence relating three guys, a knot or link here, knot or link here, but the, the last guy is a trivalent graph with an edge of multiplicity, a wedge of weight 2 there. So trivalent graphs were a natural thing to look for in the SUN situation. So then it's natural to try and compute these things in the very simplest cases for the um, unknot the representation variety is going to be the conjugacy class of this involution, which is, um, for example, if k equals 1, it's a CPN minus 1. For larger k, it's going to be a Grassmannian. Um, the um, instant knot homology will now turn out to be z to the n. Previously, it was z2, z plus z. What about the trefoil? Um, the same way we looked at the representation variety of the trefoil before, we can analyze what the representation variety is in this case in a very similar way. If I give it weight 1, um, I again get the abelian, the reducible representations, a copy of CPN minus 1. Um, the irreducibles, you know, up to conjugation, it's, it's uh, again a unique um, irreducible representation just coming from the two-dimensional representation. Um, moving it round by conjugation, though there's this, um, that's the, that S is, 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 the circ is the sphere bundle, the sphere bundle inside the tangent bundle to CPN minus 1. So the unit tangent vectors to complex projective space. Um, well, what is the instant homology then for the trefoil? Um, so our first guess and second and third guess are quite we expect to see the ordinary homology of this representation variety, as in the case n equals two. But th there's a surprise which happens here. The instant homology you generalize away from n equals two, you expect to see the same patterns. But for n bigger than two, it turns out the instant non homology of the trefoil is just z to the n, exactly the same as for the, for the unknot. Um, and in fact, um, for any knot k, if I take gamma to be k decorated with weight 1, the uh, instant dot homology just turns out to be z to the n. Um, so that, that's a, a puzzle and a potential disappointment, which I, I'm going to return to shortly. Um, I've mentioned havanov rosansky homology. We still expect I sharp of n to be related to havanov rosansky homology. Um, <coughs> SU2 led to the Jones polynomial, led to Havanov homology. For SUN, in its n-dimensional representation, there's a corresponding quantum invariant which leads to havana rosansky homology, so it's a very natural thing to look for here. Um, there are many similarities between these. Um, there's, again, a, a skein sequence um, for both of them, a long exact sequence relating the homologies of those three knots. Um, both are functorial for these interesting gadgets called foams. Uh, in the havana rosansky homology, these trivalent, trivalent graphs are called webs. Foams are certain singular cobordisms between trivalent graphs. Um, you can see, um, 
trying to sketch an example of a foam here. The, the interesting point is this one in the middle here where there are six, um, <coughs> six two-dimensional facets meeting at, at that central vertex. Um, I expect both to give the same answer for planar webs, that's trivalent graphs decorated with arbitrary integers, um, but lying in the plane. Um, but that's, that's still a, that, that's a conjectural statement still. Foams, by the way, are orbifolds too, just in one dimension higher. If I have a four ball and acted on by the diagonal matrices of determinant plus one with minus ones and ones there, that's a copy, it's a group of order eight. Um, the quotient is again topologically, homeomorphically a, a four ball, uh, but it's got these strata of non trivial stabilizers. Um, and what that four ball is, it, it's a cone. Take the one skeleton of a tetrahedron in, th in the three sphere and then take the cone on that in the four ball. Um, so the tetrahedron has six edges, you'd have these six two dimensional facets in, 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 the, um, in the ball. For planar webs, I expect the answer to be um, related to well, the answer for Varna for Rosansky homology, which is um, a vector space whose dimension is what the number of so-called Moy states. Um, there's a very simple combinatorial thing you can do. Looking at the representations of pi 1 of the complement is rather tricky in UN, but if you just look at um, representations where everything maps to the, this group of diagonal el elements with, with plus or minus ones on, on the diagonal, um, then it's just a simple combinatorial map problem of the number of minus ones has to equal the weight, and at each vertex the, uh, the minus ones have to, to join up correctly. Um, so a combinatorial thing, you don't have to talk about UN at all, those combinatorial things are, are the moi states, um, certain um, assignments to the edges. Oops. Um, so moi states are the fixed points of a torus action, just diagonal matrices. Um, so this representation value, it's um, its Euler characteristic is the number of moist states. This is a result that Lobb and Zetner proved independently. I want to spend a few moments at the end just talking about why, why something changes for n bigger than 2. Um, perhaps I'll only try and say this briefly. So if you If I gave, if I told you that some proper Morse function on some non-compact space had as critical points a, s a single point and then a, a circle here, um, and asked you what you th what what you thought the Morse homology was going to be, um, so you wouldn't be able to tell me because you wouldn't know what the differentials were, what the gradient flow lines looked like. And you might guess it's a perfect Morse function. You just get the homology of the circle and the homology of the point. Um, but you might also imagine that there's a um, there's this um, a function of this shape with a single critical point, and then also a, um, a circle's worth of critical points. Um, <coughs> in which case, there'd be a flow line here, and in fact, the homology would just be um, would just be z. When you look at what I told you the representations of variety was for SUN and even for SU2, I, I told you the representation of variety was a copy of um, a copy of CPN minus 1, and then a copy of the unit sphere bundle in the tangent space of CPN minus 1. Um, now that um, non 
naively, that, that's very much the sort of picture you'd expect if you had a, a function on the tangent spaces Cpn minus 1, um, which on the vector spaces, each tangent space at a point had this uh, shape that had a critical point at the origin and then a critical set on the unit sphere in that vector space. Um, so rather than get the homology of this guy plus the homology of that guy, it's quite natural just to get the homology of this guy alone as the, the Morse homology. Um, so if you think that's what's going on, then the question is not why for larger n is the homology so simple. The question more is why is it for n equals 2 that um, there's more than one you know, why aren't we just getting z plus z um, in the n equals 2 case? Um, so let's think about the n equals 2 case. This, is, this point here is supposed to think of that as being the 2 sphere. Think of this circle here as the SO3. It's the unit circle bundle in the tangent space of the 2 sphere. The whole space here is the tangent space of the two sphere, and its homology is, is, is z plus z. So, wh why is that not the answer <coughs> for the instant homology for SU2? Um, the answer is that for SU2 and SU2 alone, this trajectory has a, a companion, which you can't really see in this finite dimensional analog, but there are actually two, two cancelling trajectories here, one of which is a rather non trivial path of connections, other which is sort of path of connections which you'd sort of expect to see here in this finite dimensional picture. What happens for n equals 2, which doesn't happen for n equals 3, is um, a, a symmetry. Um, if I have a connection on the complement of the knot, whose monodromy around this little circle is i0, 0, zero minus i. Um, I can multiply it by <coughs> minus 1 here. So I can, if I think of a, a flat bundle E over the complement of the knot, I can change E. I can change it to, I'll write C tensor E with the original flat connection on E but on C, C is a line bundle, and its whole number is minus 1 on the link of the knot. Um, this is a slightly non-trivial operation on flat SU2 connections of the sort we're considering. Um, it doesn't apply for any larger n. If I take um, minus 1, 1, 1, 1, and multiply it by minus 1, I haven't got something which is conjugate to this guy. The, these guys are playing a, di a different role. There's a symmetry here for n equals 2 which isn't present um, in, the <coughs> in, the, in the other cases. Um, this was a little bit more about those, that situation. Um, so I want to just end with this, this last thought. Um, so the instant non-homology I've been talking about, which just comes out to be z to the n, is um, when the weight associated with the knot k is, is just one, the simplest case. Um, for other weights, I think this guy might be um, something in some sense more interesting. Um, the particular case which I think is interesting to look at is the case when p equals n over 2, which is somehow much closer to the SU2 case from the point of, of this, this symmetry. Again, multiplying by minus 1 will map this guy to something conjugate to it if the size of the minus 1 and plus 1 blocks are, are the same. <coughs> Anyway, that's um, the story of a relationship between Instanton and Havana homology, um, two things which trace their origins back to the 1980s and which uh, 
came together about five years ago. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, so what's the level of complexity computing the Kovana homology for not with N crossings? Does it make sense to ask that? You mean in the computational sense? Yes. I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, it's more than exponential in theory in the, si in the number, of, um, number of crossings N um, is the amount of time needed. Um, but in practice, algorithms are actually quite quick. Um, and there's no trouble to compute the Varna homology of a 40 crossing knot. Um, the algorithms are implemented by hand or by computer? No, they're, they're computer, but you, there's a, a you, if the knot is long and thin, then you can compute efficiently. Um, for a, a knot which isn't long and thin, you can try and break it up into tangles which are long and thin, and have a sort of divide and conquer strategy. Um, and you can you can put that you you can implement out sort of heuristics for that on the computer, so you can compute quite fast. Um, but um, Still, as far as we know, the theoretical worst case is still just the naive, more than exponential time algorithm. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, in that case, let's thank the speaker again.